this when I was laughing? I feel like we should. Easy, easy, <laughs> easy. <laughs> <laughs> is this the best thing you've seen so far? This is going to be a long hour. <laughs> what do you want for Christmas, Josh? Hey, Clarky. Well, tell oh. us about your boat. Yeah. Uh, welcome, you guys. Thanks for making time for this. Looking forward to the conversation. I feel like, you know, Jeff and I, um, over the years, have snowboarded together. And if you stand on top of a chute and you feel like there's maybe a risk of an avalanche, one false move and the whole thing will go, that's what it feels like right now. I know you guys pretty well, and I feel like one false move and this whole thing goes for an hour, out of control. Uh, I have a lot of fond memories of, of these two going back many years. Um, backstage, I was reminded that um, I interviewed Josh 12 years ago about his business at that point, and a lot has changed since then. And I imposed on Jeff his first workplace dress code. <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> With mixed results uh, at best. Um, but I look forward to the conversation. And I thought I'd start um, spending a little bit of time talking about relationships around work and around life. And Jeff, if, you'll, if you don't mind, let me start with you. Um, it's interesting to have watched your life evolve, and, and you've done a great job of blending your, your friends with your work. You have kind of one group of contacts, and, and uh, your acquaintances in your team have followed you through several investments and several projects and several deals. Um, others in the community have a harder time blending their friend world and, and their social contacts with their workplace. Talk to me just a little bit about that and, and how you find that blend. Well, I think part of it is, as an entrepreneur, you get to choose who you work with to some degree. And so why not be selfish and work with people that lift you up, that are fun to be with, and I think if you're working with people that you love to be with, then you're going to be more productive and happy and trust is higher and all the other attributes are there. So it can't always be like that uh, because you need to hire people that can do the work also. But I've been really fortunate to work with a lot of great people that were fun and that bred lots of fun outside of the workplace as it did inside. And um, turns out a lot of those people are great at what they do. And so every time we'd finish a project, whether it was vSpring or Logo Works. I felt like, geez, let's get the band back together again. We brought a lot of those people to Skull Candy. And then, you know, I basically spent the last five years at Stance. Um, now all those people are, like Clark, more difficult to recruit. So it takes a long time to get them back. But over time, we've been able to sort of get all the people back in place. And not just the employees, but the investors too. Tell me what the upside is to that approach. How is your world better, your life better, your business is more successful as a result of, you know, kind of rerounding with the same team a few times in a row? You know, one insight here is just, I think work is different today than it was even 20 or 30 years ago. And it's this notion that not that long ago we were in an industrial age and people went to factories and people produced things. And I think work was, look, it was thought of as this hard thing that you went and did, manual labor, and then Thank God it's Friday, it's all over. I can go back to my normal life. And I think the information age created a bunch of companies where people sit at computers and sit in conference rooms all day. And it's completely shifted the activity that happens during the day just in one generation. So when you start thinking about that, um, the social dynamics are much more important than they ever were before. Um, because this is a different kind of work than we did before. And I think the millennials really punctuate this because they don't look at a separate work, uh, personal life. It's blurred together. And so as an employer, if you try and segregate those two things, it just will backfire on you. I want to call someone at 9 o'clock at work and I hope at 9 o'clock at home and I hope they'll answer their phone. Um, and if I'm going to uh, ask for that, then I've also got to create a workplace during the day where they have flexibility to go to their kids' parent-teacher conference or go to the dentist or go for a surf during the day. So we just sort of said, look, we believe life's holistic, even the work part of it in the information age. So let's let it blur together and, and not try and break it apart. Jess, I've had the pleasure of being in your office a few times, felt the energy of Domo. Um, I know about the talent of the senior team and the amazing board that you have. Talk to me about how you've built the team around Domo and what are the guiding principles around that? Well, I think the, the uh it's true what everyone says, you know, it's the most important thing you have is your people and, and 
I don't think you could actually overstate that. It does get more difficult to get folks that have been there, done that. Um, but uh, you know, when you find the right people, it's they're all always 10x worth the next best person on the team. And so doing everything to you know find those kind of people is has uh, I've always felt like you know been my best move. If I look at my 10 best moves that I have in my career, six or seven of them would be a certain individual that I found and and uh, you know became convinced they were the right person for the team, and then they came in and made everything so much better. So. It's, uh, I think Utah's a little unique. Um, tech scene's way different today than it was yeah. 20 years ago. Uh, you know, I think, I remember my, my first company, we, would, we actually had bonuses based on the number of hours that you worked. And if you would work you know, 50 hours, then you'd get some tickets to some movies. If you work 60 hours, you'd get like two grand at RC Willie. If you work 70 hours a week for the month, then you know, you'd get like 20 grand at RC Willie, and we were just trying to get this culture. I'd go out and see Silicon Valley, and I'm like, they're here all the time. They're always working, like how do we compete with these people? We're smart, but they're, they're working so hard. And uh, thankfully, we just had to find the right people that, I don't want people to work hard all the time, but when you need them, when it's their responsibility, when it's their job, you want to find the person that doesn't feel like it's work, that feels like, I'm gonna win. I have passion about this. I take pride in this. I'm going to make sure this thing's the best ever because my name's on it. And uh, getting that culture, um, and I think we have a lot of companies that are like that now where people are here to win. And number of hours doesn't matter, but at the same time, I kind of say sometimes in a startup, it's uh, not just about how smart you work, it's actually how hard you work as well because you don't have the money to hire as many people as you want. And it is a compressed time frame, and there are at Omniture, there was 80 companies that were backed by VCs that competed with us. And, uh, you know, there must be somebody tweeting about this. I'm trying to figure out why has my phone got off already 30 times. <laughs> so I have no idea how it is. Tweet. I'm going airplane mode. It's distracting me. But yeah, so I'd say that's the thing that um, I think is a little unique, unique about Utah is you've got to get, it's a different culture. Um, you recognize that. You find people that'll do what it takes when it's their responsibility. But then, uh, you cannot fight the fact that it's different than Silicon Valley. It's, it's, there's families, and families are really important, and almost everybody in your organization is either married or looking to get married, and it's just the way that it is, and it's great, but you probably shouldn't plan big events on Monday night. You probably shouldn't plan Saturday events. You probably shouldn't, like I tried to the first four years of my company, uh, I made people to come and work on Pioneer Day. I'm like, you want Pioneer Day off? Take a freaking vacation day. Yeah, that didn't work very well. Uh, so I embraced Pioneer Day, which I should anyway, because I have ancestors that are pioneers, but there's just some unique things about Utah, and to the extent you embrace them, it's the best workforce. It's as smart as anyone, any other workforce. They work hard, and when they're there, they don't screw around. They're getting their stuff done, then they go home, and uh, they stay. You know, they stick around. It's not like they're transferring every two years. So I love, I love the culture here. I love building companies here. You know, in our audience, there will be several business leaders and entrepreneurs who are struggling to attract the right talent. Maybe they see somebody in the distance who they're very interested in, but it is hard because um, maybe they're a less compelling choice than some of the larger competitors. I think of you as somebody who's always sort of pioneered that recruiting effort. There are many in in Utah who have sort of followed your pattern for attracting the team. Yeah. What are some of the secret weapons that you've used? It's a really to good topic. Get that key person into your company. Yeah, and I think Jeff I think has some, I, I, I emulate Jeff a lot of times too. I watch what he's doing with stance. Every time I go down to stance, I'm like, I don't understand how you have this many A pluses in the building. But um, I think I've said uh, many times before in Utah, um, you know, I've been to a lot of round tables and they say, What's, what do we need to do to improve the state? And you know, I, often you hear the same things, you know, there's, I can't find money, okay, well your company probably sucks. Um, and when I couldn't find money, my company sucked, you know, or your pitch sucks, or you're not presenting it the right way, or you're not talking about the opportunity the right way, or maybe you're not the right person, or maybe your business just sucks. Um, but, you know, there's money, and same thing, like, you know, we can't, we can't, find, uh, we can't find the right executives, there's no engineers same thing applies. Um, and if you think you can go to Silicon Valley and it's like, you just put like, we're hiring in the window and great employees come in? No, 
it's the exact opposite. And it's the opposite here too, but again, it's different. And you know, when you try to hire employees here, number one, there's definitely some people, there's, some, there's, certain, there's certain classes of experience and talent that might not be here. Like I remember when we were trying to find, back in the day, you know, mobile app developers. They just didn't really exist here. So you had to go get them out of Silicon Valley. But you, know, you, have to just, you just go and recruit them. It's not that big of a deal. The way you always recruit is, number one, like it's red carpet. So I remember I heard a guy that got recruited by Microsoft in 1995, the guy that started Windows95.com. And it was red carpet. I'm like, that's cool. I'm going to start doing that to people. So when people come in, we send flowers to their spouse. We make sure that they go home with bags of stuff. We make sure that they go on at least an hour real estate tour so they can see what they can buy here relative to anywhere else. Um, you want to get engineers? I get the smartest engineers in our company to spend some time with them. They don't want to, but I'm like, just show them how freaking smart you are. So they're like, Ooh, these guys are really smart. And I shield them from the ones that <laughs> don't, don't come across <clears throat> that way. Um, and then I think, you know, the other thing is, every once in a while, you gotta do something that feels unnatural. And I've done that several times. Um, you know, there's plenty of employees that we paid $50,000 signing bonuses to when it was a staff engineer. Um, there's, and I don't do it all the time, you can't afford to do it all the time, but when Domo first started, and I couldn't, I had some engineers, but I just couldn't shake it free. I couldn't get the good ones to come over. And I couldn't get the Omniture ones to come over because I didn't really want them to come over. I wanted them to keep building the business that they were building. And so I started to find out some names and I went after like four guys that had names. I'm like 50 grand, 50 grand, 50 grand, 50 grand and got them in. Now some of you might be like, well, we don't have the cash to do that. Great, you can just go stock, like 0.2%, 0.2%, 0.2%, 0.2%. Or you might go 1%. You know, you might go 1% on your first four engineers. Why not? But once you get the great people in, they're worth 10 people. They will get 10 more fantastic people. So whatever it takes to get the people in um, that'll attract everyone else, I think that's what I like to do. And I love your talk with Elster. I'm sure you got lots of other ones, but. Yeah, Jeff, let me frame this for you. I think one of the things that attracts people to entrepreneurship is the idea that you get to build and design the culture of your company, like a canvas. Uh, on day one, there's one guy or two guys. You know, a few years later, there's a hundred guys. And however they interact and whatever they feel about their participation in the company, you, you, you had the opportunity to author that or you had the opportunity to just let it evolve. And you've been very deliberate, as has Josh, about the management of your culture and using it as an asset to recruit. Can you talk about that? Yes, I mean, backing up a little bit, first and foremost, um, I think the most important decision you make as an entrepreneur is the nature of the business you start. And I was at a stage in my life before we started Stance where I didn't want to get on the Silicon Valley treadmill again. I didn't want to work 80 hour weeks. I wanted a life to return to normalcy. And I wanted more of a lifestyle and I wanted to blend it with my work. So I purposely chose a lifestyle brand in Orange County where I lived, where we had lots of talent that I could recruit from Quicksilver and Billabong. <laughs> Oakley. <laughs> Not true at all, but it just makes me laugh sometimes. Like, dude, how do you build a company? It sounds like you work like 10 hours a week and surf all day. <laughs> Try to. <laughs> so I, I actually think the nature of the business matters. And it's different to be in tech. Tech is a different kind of commitment level. And um, so we, we purposely chose lifestyle brand and it became a search for a category. The first category we liked that we came upon was socks, so that became uh, the first product. But part and parcel of that was we felt like with a lifestyle brand we could build a culture around our lifestyle. And I think, you know, my mentor in this would be Rick Alden from Skull Candy. And um, he was telling me when he um, sold his first snowboard binding company, and he didn't have anything to do, wanted a job, he went and bought all his favorite magazines. And he bought fly fishing, and he bought skateboarding, and snowboarding, and he would just look through the ads, and he started applying for jobs at the companies of the things he loved. Now, what I admired about that was that he never conceived of going to work for money. It was only driven by, I wanna go work in a company that produces something that I love. And when I heard that story, it kind of stuck with me, and of course, Headphones for snowboarders was the perfect 
entrepreneurial startup for him. So um, I really wanted to do something that you know, would be local in San Clemente where I lived, have a brand and allow us to build the culture. So from a culture perspective, a couple thoughts. I think the first three, four, five hires you make are the most important. The first hire is the most important. And it's like a little DNA strand and it starts to replicate. Pretty soon at 20 people, it starts to become self-reinforcing. And the values that you share start to, to permeate into all the other people that you, you look to recruit. But we have a two-stage recruiting process. So I know that most of the people in our company are going to look for the skills and experience that you find on a resume. They want to find an accountant for the accounting department or a marketer for the marketing department. And I don't really care about that. I think anyone can become a good marketer. It's not that hard. So the thinking there is, look, uh, they're going to screen for skills and experience. I'm going to screen for personality. Because what I care about is what it feels like to work with you during the day. And if you're not fun to work with, my life's too short. So what we do is the first five people in the company, the first five employees we had, they have two of those five have to do the second interview. So when a hiring manager says, I want to hire this person, we get the, the interview. And we purposely don't look at the resume. I don't want to be biased by where you went to school, what degree you have, what job you worked at, because I don't care about that. I'm trying to understand your motivations, your heart, and what it feels like to work with you, or even better, what it would feel like to ride a chairlift with you. Like, what does it feel like outside of work? What kind of person are you really? And so my questions are all around, what books do you read? And do you have a pet? And what do you like to do outside of work? And I'm, I'm trying to unravel their personality. And I don't ask any questions about work. And if I feel like this is a really beautiful, good-natured person that would be stimulating to work with, then I approve it and say, yeah, you can hire that person. And so we've basically said, look, we're going to have a filter of two of the original five people in every second interview that prevent bad people from coming in the company. We're not going to be 100%, but that's our preventative measure. So now we're 130-ish people, and I feel like I've not only interviewed a large majority of them, but those values that we collectively, the first five people, shared, and we didn't even have to write them down because we just had them. Now we've articulated them, we've written them down, and we screen for them. But over time, you get this whole personality, this collective personality in the company. And I think that's why when you come to Stance, it feels fun, and it feels good-natured, and it feels lighthearted, and it is. And then the last thing, I'm actually very different than Josh on the culture, and I think I can be because we are a lifestyle brand, but we have a gym, and we have a skateboard ramp, and we have a basketball court. And when I see someone slouching at their computer at two in the afternoon and they're going for another coffee, I'm like, get out of your seat and go do something you love. And come back in an hour and they'll be more productive. We don't have office hours, we don't track vacation days. And again, it's this idea that we're just gonna let work seamlessly blend into their personal lives. I don't think, as a first-time entrepreneur, I would have had the courage to take that risk. I don't think I would have been that trusty. I think I would have wanted the comfort of encouraging long office hours and tight policies that would control the employees. At this stage in my life, I'm willing to experiment. It's like a big Petri dish. And so I'm kind of okay if we don't have rules and we see how it works out. And if there's some abusers, something happens, we can course correct. But up to this point, at least at 130 people, we've been able to have a completely liberal, free culture. And the leadership is really driven around, how can I help you? Not what time did you come into work? Which is just a totally different mentality of company. Let me ask you a follow-up question as I'm listening to you and thinking about how you assembled that first team. You mentioned sort of the first five. And um, there's a couple different philosophies around um, launching a new business. And you both have had quite a bit of experience with this. But one is sort of, I'm going to bootstrap, get scrappy. I'm going to be sort of the single genius with uh, a team of helpers versus I'm going to go right out of the gate and raise money because it'll be expensive, and I'm going to hire varsity players right out of the gate. And you and I have seen both, and you and I have seen both. How do you think about that now? Um, having been down the road a couple of times, would you advocate towards get a financial partner, hire the best you can, and launch that way? Or would you say test your assumptions, fail fast, bootstrap, that methodology? 
Yeah, I think it's a, it's a personal choice and you can be successful either way. So there's no right answer, first of all. But I've had a couple different experiences with it. Um, my first company was here in Provo, Utah. It was called Freeport. It was in the late 90s. And it was this amazing, colossal failure. That wasn't the first company, Jeff. Well, <laughs> first venture you should, packed company. No, your cereal box company. <laughs> come geez. on, 30 seconds. Oh, geez. Okay, we'll come back to cereal boxes. Come on. <laughs> so I had this boss. My first job, actually, at BYU, I was working part-time at the Covey Leadership Center, hence the Covey Center here today. And um, I had this boss, and he wanted to launch a new division. And the idea was we were going to take Stephen Covey's best-selling books, and we were going to put them on CDs and cassette tapes and distill them down and sell them. And I was working in this room where we basically were selling magazines and seminars to people who'd read Covey's books. And he took the top three salespeople of this group of like 30 people and said, hey, I'm just going to give you the opportunity to do this new thing and see how it works out. And the idea was, hey, look, I'm going to start with my three best people for the new project. And then if the new project's a failure, I'll know it wasn't our pricing or the product, or the, I'll know it wasn't the people because I had the right guys. And so he, he wanted to isolate the variable of people. So that principle always stuck with me. And when I first started up, I didn't really have the money to, or the connections or the know-how to hire a, a true A varsity team squad. But by the time we did stance, I was a little impatient and I just wanted to get on with it and I want to wait around for the natural growth of the bootstrapping cycle. So I went ahead and raised money right out the gate and I hired great people out the gate. In fact, I would lined them up before we ever put the whole thing together. They were in the first PowerPoint to the investors and it was only a matter of them giving their resignation uh, to their employers. So, you know, my view now is I'd rather, I think it's funner to do it with a partner and I think it's funner to do it with a team, um, but that's not the only way to do it. Zero bucks. Oh, geez. Well, so there was a time I was working for Greg, and he had me in this. This uh, guy is straight hustler right here. You're going to see it. Here we go. <laughs> so they had me in this little office in the back, and J.D. Gardner, his office was on the other side. And I'd be so bored because he'd make me wear these terrible Banana Republic outfits to work. <laughs> and... Every time JD would get on a conference call, I'd throw paper at him and try and distract him, crack jokes, and I mean, anything I could to like break the monotony. And so JD actually walks in and he's like, hey, um, have you noticed that Kellogg's is doing this promotion where you get frequent flyer miles when you buy Eggo waffles and cornflakes? It's like a coupon on the back of the box. I was kind of like, yeah, I'm not following you. And he's like, well, I was doing the math on it and the black market for frequent flyer miles is actually better than the cost that you can buy the stuff at at Costco, with the miles on the back. And um, I kind of didn't believe him, but then JD, coming from Goldman Sachs, applied math major, pulls out a whole spreadsheet showing the arbitrage. <laughs> I'm like, wow, okay, yeah, I feel you now, I get this. And he's like, and it's even better, because we're gonna donate all the waffles to the homeless shelter or the food bank and um, if that gets full, I'm going to see if the Bishop's storehouse will take the stuff, and that could be our in-kind tithing donation. <laughs> and then the whole thing is a tax write-off because we gave all the product away, so we'll just write this off. So we go down to, it was actually Sam's Club, and we asked them, you know, if we could buy some waffles. Of course, they didn't have enough waffles. And it uh, turns out a truckload of waffles at the time was $29,500. So we pulled out our Starwood American Express cards, because then we get the Starwood points, and we bought a semi of waffles. <laughs> and we had it delivered to the food bank in, uh, in Salt Lake. And we went up there and some poor steak, it was their um, service night at the food bank. <laughs> and for their service, they had to cut our coupons for the miles <laughs> off the boxes. We then spent like a whole weekend, because we were working at Vspring in the day doing, doing Greg's bidding, and, and we took all these coupons and we printed labels, because you had to put your name and address on everyone, and we filled this box. 
And we kind of sent it into Kellogg's with our fingers crossed, like, I don't even know if this will work. And we just spent $30,000 as young kids on waffles. <laughs> and lo and behold, 1.9 million miles shows up in my American frequent flyer account. <laughs> I am now lifetime platinum. <laughs> so we realized, wait a second, we can make more money doing this. So then we start a website where we can sell the miles on the black market and realize we can make more money doing this than what Greg is paying us. So we promptly go back down to Sam's Club and we order 10 semis. <laughs> and they're kind of like, okay, this is going to take a while to get. But lo and behold, like every two weeks, a new semi would show up. Pretty soon, the food bank says, you know those huge industrial freezers we have? We can't take any more waffles. We're full. <laughs> and so, lo and behold, we call the Bishop's Storehouse. And they also have industrial freezers. <laughs> so we start delivering them there. And probably four, five, six truckloads into this, Sam's Club calls and says, Kellogg's isn't going to send us any more waffles for you. <laughs> You're done. You made money. Yes, we made a lot of money. <laughs> you sound so corporate and sophisticated now. Oh, jeez. Just a street hustler. I know. Can we go back to talking about snowboarding? <laughs> it started off on the right foot, and then after that, it just kind of went downhill. You look good in Banana Republic, by the way. Oh, sort of painful days. Painful and then days. I now realize that V-Spring was only getting like 20% of your cycles. <laughs> You're over there working the Waffle Project. That's right. That's right. There's some good memories around that. Um, can I ask you guys to talk just for a minute about mentoring? maybe some examples of people who have influenced you along the way and how you think about working with your senior team, how you empower them, enable them, get the most out of them. And Josh, maybe you could start with, it's kind of a leadership principle about mentoring and enabling. Yeah, uh, I guess first I think about it just in terms of the mentoring that I received. Um, you know, I would, uh, I'd, my parents would always give me advice on how to treat people and, um, but when it came to very specific things, I'd just go and try to find an entrepreneur or someone to help me. It was professors at first at BYU, and then a couple of my investors when I finally, I couldn't get investors for two years, so we finally got some investors. Um, you know, my first company was student loans and credit cards, and um, so, I mean, I would always rather have money just to do a startup, but you just don't sometimes, uh, or most of the times. And then I found, uh, I would call, depending on the stages that, like I remember um, Greg Butterfield, Altiers was going public and we were probably, I thought a year or two years away from going public. I didn't know anybody running a public company. So I just cold called Altiers and said, hey, we have a company that's doing $20 million in revenue down the street. I'd love to hang out and just learn from you. And um, he's like, yeah, sure. We met at IHOP and had a follow up at Del Taco and, um, you know, just was able to just learn about mistakes that he'd made and things that he'd done that he thought were fantastic. And so that's how I received mentorship along the way. And then uh, I'd say internally with our team, it's, um, you know, to be honest with you, it's probably not something I'm the best at. Um, I'd say, I mean, <clears throat> like when Jeff was talking earlier about, uh, you know, restrictions you put in and um, on employees and uh, I guess we've come a long way since I was 23 when like every dollar was my dollar and um, you know like I wouldn't we didn't pay insurance we didn't pay for I remember this one time this guy came in and he said I think by law you actually have to pay me overtime because I'm working 60 hours a week and you're paying me 10 bucks an hour I'm like yeah no I don't think so um, <laughs> so but I was just trying to make a buck um, so I'm a little bit better than that now, but you know I'd say at the same time like recognizing, just trying to. I just always always had this intensity about wanting to win, and I've always felt like my job was you know I had people that were betting on coming to work at the company because they wanted to be successful, they wanted to have a career, they wanted to make money, they wanted to do something that was fun and exciting and cool and be able to look back with pride on what we accomplished on a world stage and it was as good as any other company out there. That's the way that I'm built. And so I would always go and I always felt like my number one responsibility was doing whatever I had to do to make sure that we won. And 
then you know I realized that in order to make the company more successful, you actually need to do Monday morning meetings so that the team can hear about what's going on, not just in their department, but they actually when they get the context of everything else, it makes them a lot better because they have more information. And uh, my style is just like, that's the one set meeting that we have. I have no other set meetings. I hate any other set meetings. But when anybody ever needs anything, they come and hang out. And I think the, you know, I've always had people hang out for a long time. Uh, I remember when we sold Omniture, I only had um, one VP that ever left that I didn't want to leave. Um, and five years later, he finally told me that he wished he would have stayed. So, um, you know, you treat, we, I know we've always treated them well enough. In terms of specifically about mentorship, I think the thing that we do is just like throw them in the fire and let them go. That's how I learned. Um, you know, fail fast, you mentioned earlier. I think that's in startups, especially in tech, it's all about speed. And at Omniture and Domo, I always like to feel like we make mistakes faster than anyone else. When I think uh, about that phrase, throw them in the fire, um, I just uh, want to pay you a compliment. When I think about Utah and its evolution over the past 30 years, there were people that were doing venture investing before we did, that sort of pioneered and kind of did the hard work when there were no examples to follow. And I think about you that way on the entrepreneurial side. Clearly, there are other people that are sort of following the patterns and the benchmarks that you said. But in the beginning, when you were building businesses and taking them public and selling them for amounts of money that were relatively unheard of, um, there's something to be said that you learned all this on your own and that you didn't have the same sort of patterns around you. So I, I you know, it's kind of half time and I'm just paying you both a compliment. Utah is lucky to have both of you as examples to follow in terms of the things that you bring to this entrepreneurial mix. And on that note, I want to transition a little bit from team well, culture. Well, I'd interject just one thing, Greg. Sure. I think on that, um, I, one of the most important lessons that I've learned as an entrepreneur is, uh, you, when, especially when I was young, I had a hard time trusting myself. And I was talking to uh, Jeff Bezos just recently, and I asked him, I'm like, how in the world, in 2001, in 2002, in 2003, right. did you keep the gas pedal down? How did you get away with that? Like, I really, I've always wondered how you were building out distribution centers right and left when everyone's like, they're going out of business, they're running out of money. And he's like, uh, you know, I just asked my board, I'm like, will you go on this journey with me? Like, will you, will you take this bet with me? And it, when he, the way he said it was so cheesy. And I kind of looked at him, and he's like, yeah, is that cheesy? And um, then, you know, I was asking him, like, did you always have, did you always have the confidence? And uh, he's like, yeah, that's not something I was ever lacking in. I, I've kind of had to tone it down and be like, I need to get everyone else's opinions. And I was probably the opposite. Um, and I would, you know, I was a pleaser growing up. I was the oldest of six, military family, you do what you're told, you, you know, and, and I liked it that way. And I always would think, well, if all my investors are telling me I should do that, I should definitely do that then. I really shouldn't even consider this other, like, gnawing, you know, idea that I have that's, and over the time I've kind of learned when someone's really gnawing at you or when you really are excited about something or when you really want to do something that, you do that. And I avoided a couple of giant pitfalls along the way when I didn't have someone necessarily telling us how to navigate the VC stuff or the banker stuff or going public stuff or the analyst stuff where I finally got to the point where I'd made enough mistakes when everyone else told me to do one thing and I did it and I, but I thought I should do something else. That pain was so great. I was like, I don't care if everyone else is even right. If I want to do it this way, I'm going to do it that way because I can't live with myself. If I do it that way and it turns out okay, I'm always wondering if it could have been better. If I do it that way and it was wrong, oh, I, 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 I feel like I violated myself, you know? So that's kind of how, I, I think that that's a really important message that I would want to leave with everybody is just, you got to get to the point where you do completely trust your gut. It's funny because I'd always call Josh for advice. Hey, what do you think about this? And there was never any hesitation. He'd be like, this is what you do. <laughs> so now that I know that he didn't believe any of that. <laughs> you know, you and I had an interesting exchange one day. I don't know if you'll remember this. Uh, but er early on in your career, you were interacting with my first firm, Vspring. And um, we didn't manage it well on our side. And when all the dust settled, you had great conviction about what you were 
pursuing, and, and we as a firm didn't wrap our heads around it in the right way. And I felt terrible. I believe the comment from our partner meeting from one of the partners was, I said, we should do this deal all day. Two and a half million on eight pre gets it done right now. Josh is too pig-headed. That was the comment. <laughs> I will not indict the individual who said that. Okay. Maybe, true. Maybe true. We would have made some money. I'm not pig-headed. That's not nice. <laughs> a few months after that, I called you up and asked you for a conversation, and it was 10 at night. We went to a Mexican restaurant. Do you remember this? Yeah. I sat down with you and said... Uh, we went to the Los. I, I said, uh, I just am apologizing on behalf of the firm and, and, and more or less the investment community that we haven't managed this conversation well. You can say yes or no, but you can do it in a way that's graceful and not arrogant. And, and I, part of your question was, what is it that you want? And I said, nothing other than to apologize. I mean, the, the courses are set now, and you'll go your way and raise money from other people. And um, our very early days had some interesting exchanges where I felt like, you know, we made mistakes, and it was because you had so much conviction about what you're doing that people who couldn't wrap their minds around, you know, something that new and innovative with that much conviction behind it just uh, missed out on what would have otherwise been a great opportunity. Well, it was, a, it was definitely, it was, there was definitely periods where it was, where it was a hard time, and um, you know, one of the things that was going on back then is, I mean, everyone was losing money everywhere. Yeah. And I had, uh, oh, I had one, I had 20 of my investors telling the VCs that they should invest. This is a great deal. You should look at Josh. And then I had one guy that gave me a bad reference, who you know. And um, the thing that frustrated me was that uh, I've always told. Um, Everybody, I, I'm totally okay with no. No is great. Um, and I love that Greg came down. He's like, I want to figure out what happened. Let's talk about what happened, and I want to apologize. And like, which I was like, what? I don't trust you. What's going on here? What are you trying to do? And uh, it's kind of a sketchy dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just the conversation I didn't trust. Not Greg. I just didn't. I'm like, what's going on? But the thing that frustrated me is the 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 other partner that I was working with shook my hand and said, we have a deal. And then for, you know, and had 20 people tell him that we were a good deal, and one person said that uh, he didn't trust me, and he's like, I'm out. And I'm um, like, well, I thought we shook hands. I thought we had a deal. And so that's when I was done. I was like, we're done forever. Burn the bridges. I'll do everything I can to make sure your life's miserable for the rest of my life. Um, and then Greg called. He's like, let's talk. Um, but, you know, I think that, that I think that is one way that our community has dramatically changed. There's sophisticated investors. There's plenty of investors. Back in the day, you get one term sheet, and it was all three investors giving you one term sheet. You had no alternatives. And today, that's not the case, and I think that's fantastic. And guys like you have emerged and stuck around because you have integrity. And I think as entrepreneurs and people that run businesses, that's really all you want. I'm totally okay with no, but just have integrity in the way you go about things. What's unusual about the two of you that is not true about all entrepreneurs is that you're also investors. You have really sizable uh, investment portfolios on your own account. Some would say they're angel style investments, but actually the logos of the companies that you've invested in are very impressive and your results are very impressive. Some things you've done together, some things you've done independently. I'm interested now in talking a little bit about your investments and can you, and maybe Jeff, would you mind just kind of describing um, why you're an angel investor and what your experience has been, how you philosophically think about it? And then uh, Josh, maybe a little bit about the companies that you seek. So we do do a lot of angel investing. I think part of it is because I spent four years working with Greg and I learned the craft and will always be part of who I am. I love operating a business, so I think I'm more an operator than an investor. Um, but that's given me an opportunity to empathize with um, entrepreneurs in a different way. Um, you know, I think one interesting fact, you know, Josh and I were neighbors in college. And I think we spotted each other early as like, okay, alpha dog. And, um, and you, we ended are up... Are you going to tell them? No, I'm not going to tell that part. You're not going to try to make me look bad? <laughs> no, I would never do that. <laughs> I couldn't get the girls. And uh, there's one reason that Jeff got them instead. It's just because he could afford a boat. So I want to make sure the record hey. right now is clear. <laughs> Don't knock the hustle. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I didn't know about the hustle. I just thought you were some rich kid. Daddy gave you a boat. But no, I respect you more. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> 
my first investment was actually in Omniture. And Josh called me and said, hey, we're doing a round. Would you like to participate? And I didn't have a whole lot of money. So investing $50,000 in Omniture at the time was actually a sizable check for me. You're doing me. yourself a disservice. That's not what happened. He called me and said, I want to put money in Omniture. I said, it's full. He said, Josh, you got to let me in. I really want to put some money in. And I'm like, Jeff, the valuation is so high. I don't want to lose your money. You're like, no, dude. Let me put my money in. We're friends. Let me do it. I get it. I'm like, okay, I can probably carve some room out, you know. I'll take you on my boat with some chicks. <laughs> <laughs> that would work. <laughs> yeah, that, another page out of your playbook. <laughs> so uh, I think that forever endeared me to Josh. And I think one thing that happens as an investor is when your first investment goes well, then you know other uh, entrepreneurs looking for money come to you. And I think I've been fortunate in that. I've been able to see a lot of great deals over the years. Um, sometimes I invest because I did a company called Julep that makes beauty products, but I have three daughters, and they name their nail polishes after daughters, after, after women. So I had my daughters get their own nail polish, and I'd fly them up to board meetings and take them to the nail salon. And for me, it was a way to teach entrepreneurship to my daughters. And so I didn't even really care about the money. When Andreessen Horowitz came in and did the next round, that felt really good, but it was really about the beauty products um, and, and my daughters. Uh, so. Sometimes it's that, sometimes it's fun. I've done a wetsuit company, a recycled shoe company, because I loved the people and believed in the mission. I never honestly thought for a second I would get my money back. I looked at it as a charitable donation. I don't tell the entrepreneurs that, but I was like, I'm writing this off. But I believed, I believed the entrepreneurs needed, needed a chance and needed someone to believe in them, and they should have had a chance to execute that business, so I put money in. Um, and then there are other times, um, you know, it is financially motivated. Um, you know, when I looked at Uber, um, you know, Josh and I looked at it together. It was a deal we did together. And um, they had 9,000 customers in San Francisco, $1.3 million in trailing revenue. And we paid a $270 million pre-money to get in that deal. But I did a spreadsheet of the 100 largest markets. And I realized that San Francisco on its own could be a 50 to $100 million market. And I was looking at how many markets around the world have that kind of size. And I realized, okay, it's kind of binary. If this works, it's a multi-billion dollar revenue company quick. It's just how fast can you scale? And that was one where it just went according to plan. And so sometimes it is financially motivated. We see an opportunity that's interesting and we pile into it. Um, and sometimes it's something we just love. Um, so I wouldn't say there's a rhyme or reason, you know, certainly we look at the entrepreneur and their background and their passion. We look at the market and all the dynamics, the positioning, competitors. We look at the deal itself. We look at the financial leverage. But none of those things really dictate whether we do it or not. Those are all just pieces of the puzzle that we learned at vSpring, looking at lots of companies and the patterns of success. Sometimes the companies don't line up that way and we do it anyway. And sometimes they have all those things and we don't do it. Um, so there's no formula. If there was, everyone would, you know, check all the boxes and just do it. I think one thing that's, that's differentiated us, I think our returns are far better than most funds. We're investors in a lot of the big funds. You're like, Jeff's like, he's being very humble right now. He's like, I mean, 50 for 50, maybe 50 for 52. It's not quite like that. But it's pretty much like that. This guy is crazy, crazy, crazy good investor. So I called him, I'm like, bro. I don't even care what it is. Just call me, tell me the amount. I'm in. I don't want to invest anywhere else. I just want to invest when you invest. And so that's, we've been investing, we've been investing a lot. And then he's like, hey, I know Will Smith really well and Jay-Z really well, and I think we can use them to get into deals. That's one of, that's the way that we got into Uber. Yeah. And, you know, I knew the investors, so I called some of the investors. I'm like, hey, you guys did the last round. Should we put money in? He's like, uh, I can't tell you. I shouldn't really say anything, but I'm definitely not saying no, you know? Um, but it's been, yeah, it's been really fun leveraging, leveraging those relationships and, and uh, just building out that portfolio. Yeah, I think the difference is uh, when a venture capitalist does it, there's a firm and a decision-making engine. When we do it, we're doing it as friends. And as Josh likes to say, he's like, I'm the entrepreneur's entrepreneur. And to me, what that means is like, I have the empathy, I understand. And I like to be the one that gets the phone call a month before the board meeting from the entrepreneur who says, it's not working, I got problems, how do I explain this to the board? 
rather than the venture capitalist in the board meeting who gets the positioned information a month late. And so I think we were able, because we're CEOs, we're not full-time investors, we're able to, to do it in a different way. I told him that wasn't really a slight to him about VCs. Jeff gets the first call because he has waffle skills and they're looking to leverage <laughs> that. I think I've done a lot of angel investing. I started out mostly because I was like, I honestly, as cheesy as it sounds, I just wanted to help out Utah. I felt like there were guys that helped me out. Most of my investors were real estate guys. There were guys that made money in apartment complexes. And I ne desperately needed their money when I was raising angel money. Um, and you know, now that there's more and more and more tech people, it's fun that there's, you know, I'll meet companies like, oh, this entrepreneur invested or this executive over at that company invested and this angel that's invested in 25 other tech deals invested. So uh, that's kind of how I started. But my deals originally was like, I'd put 100 grand in something and then they'd call me and they'd be like, hey, we lost all your money. I'd be like, oh my gosh, thank goodness I'm out of that deal. And then sometimes they'd call me like, hey, we made five extra money. I'm like, oh my gosh, thank goodness I got out of that deal. Um, I just always kind of found them to be stressful once I got in them. And, uh, but at the same time, and then as some of them started growing, it's really fun to help um, entrepreneurs figure out, you know, hey, I'm getting a term sheet from a VC. Um, you know, can you look at it? Yes, absolutely. I'll tell you the three things that burnt me the first time. Um, you know, I'm talking to... I'm talking to two VCs, how should I pitch it? You know, okay, let's talk about how to position this thing and make sure you're doing the walk away and I mean, that kind of stuff is so fun to me or I'm trying to recruit this guy. So I really enjoy that part of the relationship with the entrepreneur once, once we've invested. Josh is the best fundraiser I've ever met by a country mile. Me too. Best presentations, best salesmanship. Uh, one day he called me and he said, uh, hey look, I want you to come down. I'm gonna raise some money for this new company. It wasn't called Domo yet. Um, and I want to think about who we approach for fundraising, what it looks like. So I come down to Josh's office and there's like names on the board and it's like Benioff and Bezos and Eric Schmidt. I think I can get a million from him, a million from him, a million from him. And do we talk to the funds? Which funds? And he had to go walk out the office. So I erased <laughs> someone's name and I put my name there instead. And I was like, so I, I definitely am putting a placeholder in here. But he went through and gave me the vision for Domo. And I remember it was like an eight minute long commercial. And I had the thought, like I had never been so captivated by an entrepreneur pitch anywhere. I mean, at vSpring, I'd see three entrepreneur pitches a day for four straight years. And as an angel, I've seen, I don't know, hundreds of business plans and, and pitches over the years. I had never seen someone describe the problem, the solution, how they were gonna do it with such conviction ever. And I remember just thinking, I just saw the best uh, salesmanship of a deal ever that I will ever see. I'm like, I'm in. And this was a $130 million pre-money seed deal. <laughs> um, and so, you know, as we now go out and we fundraise, I'm always talking to Josh about, hey, what do you think about this angle, this presentation? And, and obviously it's worked for us, we've raised $86 million to sell socks from Sand Hill Road. Um, you know, so that's Josh's pixie dust on our, our fundraising. You know, this is an interesting point. I want to go one step further on this because early in my career as people would come and ask, you know, what are the most important characteristics of an entrepreneur? And I wrestled for a few years with sort of creativity and leadership and execution and a variety of ideas that would stay in my head for a year or two and then I'd sort of lose momentum. I'd feel like that's, that's not really the secret. And, um, I was probably 40 when I sort of landed on this idea of sort of influence and persuasion. And at first blush, it seemed like kind of a shallow view of how entrepreneurs are successful. But the more time I've spent sort of with that in the back of my head and meeting people like you, and you're an amazing storyteller too in terms of sort of painting the value of the project that you're working on. I think the two of you are best in class. But when you think about the activity of entrepreneurship, you're recruiting board members that you, you can't pay for them. Their talent is, is too extraordinary, but you want them to get, get them to care about your project. You're hiring people you can't afford to pay. You're persuading customers when you're not the strongest incumbent. You're talking to investors who you might not be sort of the least risky avenue. So all around you as an entrepreneur on every front, um, it's a conversation that involves persuasion. You're trying to get other people to buy into your vision. 
commit their careers, their lives, their life energy to the project as you've conceived of it. And the underlying persuasion requirement uh, uh, in that is extraordinary. It's truly extraordinary, and you two are a couple best in class. Talk to me a little bit about persuasion and the role that you guys um, think that is played in your projects of recruiting and fundraising and well, it's funny, I, selling. Last night, <clears throat> there were some tweets that were going out about uh, ask questions, and um, it looked like it was coming from your account. <laughs> ask questions. If you have any questions you want to ask Jeff, uh, Jeff and Josh, and some jackhole sent a uh, question that said, um, Josh, can you tell me how to sell vaporware without pissing off your customers? I'm pretty sure that was a slight. <laughs> but um, hearing Jeff talk uh, about uh, you know, what uh, he thought of my ability to persuade, maybe that's um, you know, not such a bad thing after all. But you know, I'd say at Omniture, I was really hesitant to sell ahead of what we had. And I would see us lose chances in the market because I would mm -hmm. see competitors use marketing for what it is. It's conveying a message. It's conveying an aspiration. It's conveying what you want to be. What your brand is is not what the company is actually selling. Nike is not selling, you know, you're going to be in, you're going to be fit and you're in, and the most empowered individual in the world. That's not what they sell, but it's how it makes you feel and it makes you buy the product. And if they didn't do that in advance of having products that all met you know, the aspiration, then they would have never been as successful as they were. So I think I learned that over the years. And, um, you know, but I think, I think something that, it's interesting to hear you say that, Greg, because I was talking to Matt Kohler, the guy at Benchmark, you know, and he's done Instagram, Uber, uh, what are the other big ones he's done? Instagram, Uber. Well. He was one of the first five employees at both Facebook and LinkedIn. Facebook, LinkedIn, um, and he said, you know what makes, he's like, I, I look at entrepreneurs and they're usually pretty much 100% of the time a royal pain in the butt. And they don't listen, they're really obstinate, and you kind of have to shake them to make them pay attention um, when you really think that they're wrong. And uh, I think though that one of the things that goes along with it, if I was defending the entrepreneurs, because some of those things can sound negative, I'd say genuine, authentic. That's where I would go. Yeah. You know? I think when your pitch is authentic and the vision is authentic, that's when it appeals to everyone across the board. It's the authenticity and the sincerity that makes it work. Yeah, and that's what I love about entrepreneurs and all the entrepreneurs that are here and people that are in startups. I mean, it's personal, you know, and you love and you love that thing it's your baby you want to make it go and so um, I would uh, I think it's probably the most important for you have a couple different constituents you have your employees convincing them to come keeping them excited keeping them motivated painting the big picture being authentic and real with them showing them the bad stuff but still painting the big picture showing how you can get from step A all the way up to step B having the credibility if you don't have the credibility to go all the way over here just show them how you can go from here to here because you have that credibility. I think that is probably the most important place that you need to be influential. Because you get that, then the VCs, the angels come in, they hear the other employees, yeah. and they get convinced because they see everyone singing, singing from the same sheet of paper. We're towards, thanks Josh, we're towards the end of our time and um, I'd like to give you guys an opportunity to provide some advice. You know, we have entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience and you guys have been at it a long time and, and extraordinarily successful at it. We've had a thread of questions around you know, people and culture and a thread around investing and company development. Now just open blank slate. If you could you know, say, hey, here's a couple things I've learned along the way, a couple pieces of advice, and maybe we could close on that. So either one of you share a couple parting uh, pieces of advice for our audience. Um, hey, I'll start. Um, uh, you know, and adding on to uh, you know, where Josh started, which was, hey, it's all about the people. I feel like I was really fortunate at BYU. I had these great professors, um, people like Ron Lindorf, that invested in my failure and then put more money into my next company after the first one failure, failed. And every job I've ever taken in my life, every group of people I've ever worked around, I didn't seek the money first. Uh, when I joined vSpring, believe it or not, Greg was not paying a lot. Shocking. <laughs> and 
uh, it was really a decision about, hey, look, I can work with this guy who seems to be a really thoughtful, methodical investor. And for th the first three years of eSpring, I think I sourced some pretty good deals, and I think I was feeling, you know, pretty full of myself. And um, I felt underpaid. And I would go back to these guys and say, dude, we're providing too much value. You need to pay us more money. Give us more carry. And they would kind of, no. Uh, when I left there, this strange thing flipped. And I realized that all those all-nighters that I would spend writing these investment memos and researching companies and doing references, all of a sudden, um, I realized this was like the greatest education I ever had. And it took me leaving the firm to get to that point. But I had left with this craft on how to be an entrepreneur and how to invest. And it was kind of like, geez, I should have been paying them. Like the value that I had from being in a room with all these great entrepreneurs, not just the entrepreneurs at the firm, but all the entrepreneurs that would come in and pitch us and give us an information advantage because they would teach us about all these markets and opportunities. And our job is just to catalog all that information. It's a really great perch. And then after, after that, every company that I've been involved with, my partner Morgan, Clark and Noel, LogoWorks, amazing partners to work with. You know, being at BYU with um, Todd Peterson, one of my first business partners, and Josh, and having these great intuitive entrepreneurs that I could call any time with questions, and I did. Um, you know, all the way up to um, today, where I have these great board members um, that I work with that help me on my current venture, great employees. So for me, like top to bottom, the question of mentoring, um, when, I, when you choose a job, don't make it about the money, make it about who you get to work with. When you choose a company, make it about the people you work with, not necessarily the company itself. I'd much rather work at a B plus opportunity than the A opportunity if the A opportunity was a bunch of people that weren't fun to work with. Josh, do you have a parting thought? Yeah, I think uh, I'd say, I always say a couple things to entrepreneurs. Number one. Uh, just do it. Just start it. Stop thinking about it, talking about it. Just start making mistakes, and you learn so much that way. And then the second thing I'd say is uh, probably the best epiphany that I ever had was, you know, I'd real, I'm nev I've never had an A minus day at the office. I'm always giving it my all. I'm always giving 110 percent every moment that I'm there. And sometimes I'd realize that when I'd go home, I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna reset. I get to go home and relax and. I think the best epiphany that I had is realizing that as you're going home, like, I'm putting on my game face again. Like, what do I need to do with each of my kids? What do they need? Um, and, you know, work just as hard and just as organized with, uh, you know, with your family and the stuff that really truly gives you that great happiness and satisfaction as you do at the office and you'll end up in a better place. On behalf of the organizers and sponsors, on behalf of our audience, let me thank both of you for your insights today. Thank you very much for participating with us. Thank you. Thank you.